description of amazing grace. I found something out this week. The praise team is coming. I found something out. Um, it took me three days in, in my worship part of my prayer to sing all the songs that I know in the Redback Hymnal. It wasn't pretty. And I didn't know the beat of some of them. I just knew the words on some of them, so I would read them. So if anybody was outside of this church at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the morning, if it was you, I apologize to the bears, the deers, the raccoons, and the stray cat that's been hanging around here. Uh, it wasn't pretty, but uh, there's some powerful songs in this red back hymnal that we do not sing. I just began to look. I said, I don't know that song, but I began to read the words. And I was like, wow, there's some powerful words in that, that, that song book. A powerful message. Then begin to look at the dates. Anybody remember that song, Old Camp Meeting Day? That's in our red back hymnal. I believe that song was wrote in 1934. And that one verse says that in this new day, in this new day, they say, thank religion. There's a better way, thank religion. They said, but I want that old time. When I think about that old time, I think of the 50s, the 60s. I have, for, for me, I have to think old time, in my lifetime, the late 70s. But this song, right, was 1934, and he said, I'm thinking, so what the old time is. And we need that old time way of singing, praying, preaching, shouting. But there's a lot of songs in that Redback hymnal that we don't know. There's probably many more in the songs we love to sing. It took me one day to go through all of those that I knew. And I know more of them than, than most do because I attended a church that we sung out of that quite frequently. There's a lot in that. There's a lot of power. That, what I'm saying is there's power in the words of songs. I love, I love music. I can't sing, but I will sing because I love the Lord. And I love the message of a song. And I will sing my soul's best song. And I will worship Him and I will praise Him. And the praise team this morning, they're going to do my favorite song that they do. I've told them this. Uh, it's maybe nobody else's favorite. Sometimes when I tell them we're doing it, they're like, again, evidence. And, and I love this song. I love this song for several reasons. I love it because it talks about the goodness of God that's on my life. And, and I'll get deeper into that uh, here in a few moments when I preach. But I also love this song because... I don't remember when it was introduced to us, but when it was introduced to us, it was determined that Paul would sing the verses, would lead in the verses. And as he begins to sing, I say, how fitting, how fitting that he is leading the verses because of what God has. If you don't know this man's testimony, if you can get him to talk to you uh, in, in, in private setting, uh, he's an introverted extrovert, I say. But if you could hear his testimony... And what God has done and how God has moved in his life, you will say, man, if a song ever fit a man, that song fits that man. And I am reminded of God's goodness on his life. I'm reminded of God's goodness on my life. And as they begin to sing, why don't you think about all the evidence? Because Satan's trying to pull up a lot of evidence against you. All your faults, all your failures, all your shortcomings. He stand, think about this. If this was a courtroom this morning, that judge is standing up there. The devil is presenting his case. The devil is presenting his case and saying, I've got evidence that they did this, that they did that, that they did this, and they did that. But then our counselor steps into the room. You know who our counselor is? Jesus. And Jesus stands there, and he stands there, and he says, I don't know what you're talking about. Why? Because before you stepped into this courtroom, you repented. Right? You repented. And so Jesus says, uh, Your Honor, I don't know what he is talking about. All I can find is the evidence of my Father's goodness all over their life. So if that's you this morning, if you would get nervous to know that you were stepping into a courtroom... And the devil's going to present his case. If that made your heart rate speed up a little bit to think, man, I've had some faults and I've got some failures. I've got some flaws and I've got some shortcomings. And the devil is about to reveal and uncover all of my mistakes. And you say, I'm guilty. I know I'm guilty. And the only plea that I have to offer 
is that Jesus shed his blood for me. So I claim the blood that Jesus shed for me on Calvary. And I repent of my faults, my failures, and my shortcomings. And now you can stand in victory in the courtroom and in the house of God this morning and say all you can see and all I can see is the evidence of his goodness all over my life. So as they begin to sing, Sister Amy, if you'll pull up the first verse, I'll be back there in just a second. If you will begin to stand with me as they begin to sing and just think about that. As they say, sing the words. Let these words minister to you, but also think about the evidence of God's goodness. You can specify. You know, this is general talking in these songs, but you can make it specific for your life. What is that evidence of His goodness that's all over your life? All throughout my history Faithfulness is walked beside me. The winter storms make way for spring. And every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my all over my life I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life all over my life help me remember when I
for your goodness that's all over my life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Sister Amy, you could probably turn down the monitors a little bit. Got a ringing up here. Thankful for the goodness of God. It's all over my life. We, we said this last week, kind of old thing in the church. Maybe you remember, God is good all the time. God is good, and His evidence is all over our lives. Turn with me this morning to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter number 3. And uh, if you have a Bible marker that you keep in your Bible, just go ahead and mark Philippians 3. We're going to be in there for a few weeks, Philippians chapter uh, number 3, and we're going to look this morning at verses 13 and 14. Philippians chapter 3, and verse 13 and 14. I, I don't have any notes this morning. I've got a few verses um, that's, that's been on my heart this week, this being the main verse. And so I come to the pulpit this morning with no notes. Some say, good, you won't preach as long. Usually that means I preach longer. But I just jumped something on my heart as I was praying uh, this week, and it's going to take me a few weeks to, to get through it. But I want us to look there this morning for a text. Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse number 13. Brethren, I count not myself... To have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Father, we do thank you this morning for the great privilege that we have to come into your house. There is nothing better than being in your presence. There's nothing better than worshiping you with brothers and sisters in Christ. We're thankful for the evidence of your goodness that's all over our lives. Thankful for your blessings. Thankful for your mercy. Thankful for your loving kindness, which is better than life. We desire greatly your anointing this morning. Desire your anointing to be upon me to preach this word. And desire your anointing to be upon the congregation to receive it that we may put it to work in our day-to-day living and operation. We just ask you right now that you would tip the horn of the oil of the anointing upon us in this place as we worship you, as we magnify you, as we share your word for this day, for this service, for this week. And we know that you're faithful as promised. So we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for what's going to be accomplished here today in the remaining part of this service and around these altars. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You might be seated. Paul writing here, he starts off verse 13. He says a lot leading up to this point. You can read his letter to the Philippians. but He gets here to chapter 3, verse 13. He said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. And this has always been an interesting statement to me that Paul makes next. He said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind. That's what I want to focus on, that first part of this three-part conclusion that Paul gives when he says that he counted not himself to apprehend what he did and what he does. Because the first thing he said is, I forget those things which are behind. And I began to think about that. I've thought about it over the years, and I began to think about it uh, this week. What did Paul mean by forgetting those things which are behind? Did he mean forget everything? Did he mean uh, uh, to, to let everything go and uh, just live for today? I, I have found this, though, to be true in my life, uh, that what happens to me and what happens to many, if you're honest, is that we begin to think on things that happened to us, things in our past, And we begin to get, anybody else get this way? You feel bogged down. You feel bogged down and and you can't concentrate and you can't focus because uh, you can't forget this battle. You can't forget this loss. You can't forget that you gave in to that. I can't believe I did that. And you just can't forget. And the devil never lets you forget. 
He keeps reminding you in case you did forget. And, and so, uh, when I have a hard time with that sometimes when I begin to focus on that, that I can't do, that I'm distracted. And usually I'm distracted because I'm thinking about something of the past. Uh, but also this, in, in the, these verses, he goes on to say, uh, looking under those things before I press towards. Uh, I'm also been guilty of getting so called up on what's coming. What do I need to do next? Uh, and, and my wife will tell you, she says that I'm more of a fly by the seat of your pants and she's more of the planner in, in our, in our planning and our couple and that we are. Uh, because I have found that when I look too much to future things, I get overwhelmed. How in the world are we going to do that? How in the world am I going to afford that? How in the world, you know, and, and I begin to get overwhelmed. And then again, here I am. My right now is hindered. My right now is prevented by worrying about something that hadn't even happened yet. Then I read this statistic. Sister Gilda says 95% of the things that we worry about don't even take place. But then, but then I'm that optimist or that pessimist probably. But what about the 5%? What about 5%? But so... If whether we're hindered by the past or hindered by the present. So what I found that Paul is saying here in these verses uh, is in his forgetting uh, the things which were behind. Uh, uh, he did not mean that really, really at all. He did not mean to forget completely, uh, but he had a point that he was bringing across. And, and, uh, and some things that, that I look to and I found in the Word of God uh, that lets me know that, it, that we don't need to forget everything. It's found in the, the words a couple places. It, it's throughout the Bible, but just a couple places that stuck out to me this week. Psalms 103 and 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind me. The psalmist said, forget not all his benefits. So in your forgetting, forget not all of his benefits. Psalms 119 verse 16 says, I will delight myself in thy statues. Uh, get this. I will not forget thy word. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, but the psalmist said, I will not forget thy word. So in your forgetting, uh, you need to forget those things which are behind. Uh, Paul was not incorrect. Paul was absolutely correct, uh, but we need to understand what we're reading. We need to understand what Paul is saying. Uh, he says, in your forgetting, uh, do not forget God's benefits. In your forgetting, uh, do not forget his word, because his word is a lamp to our feet. Uh, Psalms 119, I believe, 115 tells us that, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. Uh, so in all of your forgetting, there's some things that you do not need to forget. Uh, so for just a few moments this morning, uh, I want to ask you a question today. Uh, do you remember? Do you remember? Paul said, I have not counted myself to apprehended, brethren. I, I have not, but this one thing I do. Uh, I've not got there yet. I've not figured it all out. I don't have it all accomplished, and I don't have it all together. Uh, people's looking at him as a spiritual leader, and they look. you look at us, spiritual leaders, and you think, well, you've got it all together. You've got it all figured out. Uh, let me just join Paul this morning and tell you, uh, I count not myself to ap have apprehended. Uh, I have not got it all figured out. Uh, I have not uh, got it all laid out uh, and have a greater a great understanding. I've got a greater understanding than I did before, uh, but I don't have that great understanding. I, I don't have that great forgetting ability either uh, because there's things uh, that want to hinder me, uh, that want to prevent me, that want to stop me uh, and wanted to prevent Paul. Uh, Paul wrote about it. He said there was a thorn in the flesh, uh, a messenger of Satan uh, to buffet him. Uh, and you know what the conclusion that Paul and myself in talking about we've come to? Uh, that that messenger of Satan that came to buffet him was? It was Saul. It was the man that he was. It was the man that he was. Uh, always there. Always hanging around. Uh, always uh, standing there in the way. Uh, and what Paul, I believe, is writing here uh, is he said, I need to forget about Saul. Uh, you need to forget about who you were. Uh, you need to forget about what you did uh, in the flesh. You're always going to remember uh, and have memories of childhood, uh, of teen years, uh, stupid stuff you did, crazy stuff you did, uh, good times that you've had. Uh, Brother Laney and I was 
was reminiscing about some things uh, in our past the other day. Not all good things that we did, uh, but we can't help but to remember them. Uh, do you remember? Uh, do you remember? Uh, it does you well when you go to get on to your teenage kids to remember that you was once a teenager. What does that mean? You were once stupid too. We did dumb things. We messed up. We, we came up short. And we turned out pretty good. But do you remember? Do you remember? And we say, yeah. Yeah, I remember. I'll never forget. I'll never forget what she said to me. Come on. I'll never forget how he treated me. I'll never forget how I started off this thing in good intentions and I failed. That, that don't that sound exciting at all, does it? So when Paul said, this one thing I've learned, forgetting those things which are behind, he said, those are some things uh, that you need to forget. That you need to forget. Look at your neighbor this morning and just tell him, forget about it. Forget about it. Forget about it. Huh? What do you? What do I need? What is Paul saying? We need to forget about. What is he saying that he he needs to forget about? Huh? He's saying I need to forget about those things that bring me down, that drag me down, huh? that stop me from being uh, spiritually what God wants me to do. Huh? I know you remember. Huh? I know you remember uh, uh, that what she said to you or what he said to you. Uh, there's some of you that remember uh, things that I preached before and you didn't like it and you're still mad about it. Uh, can I tell you this morning, just get over it. Uh, just forget about it. Uh, just put it behind you. Uh, just lay it aside uh, because it isn't about, you're not doing them any good by staying mad about it. Uh, it's like drinking poison uh, and expecting somebody else to die. Uh, if they hurt you, uh, if they said something hurtful to you uh, and they may not have even realized it uh, but if they did realize it and they knew what they said uh, they don't care anyway uh, so why do you spend all your time uh, remembering it uh, just forget about it forget about it. Uh, Paul said if we're going to get anywhere, uh, this is a part of refresh uh, if we're going to get anywhere we got to bring it to the altar he said I did yeah you brought it to the altar but you took it back with you you got to bring it to the altar, take the handle off of it, and leave it there. Peter wrote this, casting all your care upon the Lord. Cast all of that remembrance of things in the carnal. You ever run into somebody you hadn't seen in years, and they remember a lot about you, but it's things that you didn't want them to remember? I've, I've ran into people over the years. I've, I've never gone to a, a class reunion because I didn't graduate with the people that I grew up with. Uh, so I have not gone to any class reunions. Uh, but when I run into people, especially since Facebook came out and they, they look me up or they find me or come across me on social media, they say, you're a preacher? You're a pastor? Well, I remember. Do you remember? Like, yeah, I remember. Could you please not post that on my wall? Could you send that in a DM, please? You remember when we did this? You remember when we did that? You remember when you did this? Uh, do you remember when that teacher did this and then you responded in this matter? Uh, you remember? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to forget that, but uh, I, I do remember. It. It's uh, it's hard, but Paul said the only way that I can uh, move forward, the only thing that I can step out of Saul into Paul, uh, the only way that I can step out being a persecutor of a Christian to being a leader of the Christians uh, is I've got to forget some things. Uh, I've got to forget about it. I've got to forget uh, about what I did as Saul. Uh, I've I've got to forget the way I walk as Saul. I, I've got to forget what my path was. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 8, Paul talks a lot about that. He said, who uh, can deliver me from this body of death? Uh, he said, who can deliver me uh, from me? Uh, and he came to the conclusion, he said, it's only Jesus. Uh, those of us who thought that when we got saved and we got born again, uh, that everything was going to be this grand, great walk in the park, uh, you would never have any temptations. Uh, you'd never have any desire to do worldly things anymore. Uh, and you would be given a t-shirt that said super Christian uh, and you would just be able to just uh, uh, have a march uh, on and a walk in the park and everything would be great. Uh, nobody would ever die. Nobody would ever hurt your feelings. Uh, nothing in your house would never break. Uh, your car tires would never uh, run out. And all, like the children of Israel, their shoe leather never wore out. Uh, and all of these great things was going to take place. Uh, that you'd never get mad. That you'd never get upset. Uh, that nothing would ever bother you. Uh, and it would just be a lifestyle 
uh, of just continual glee and, uh, and wonder. Uh, can any seasoned Christian in this house tell me if that's true? Not true. <laughs> Not true. Because this flesh is going to always hang around. Paul wrote, in just about every letter that Paul wrote, you know what he made emphasis on? Give not occasion to the flesh. Do not walk in the flesh. He talks a lot about the enemy being the devil, but he also talks about the enemy of the flesh. You've got to get past self. He says in in several places, walk in the spirit, that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What is Paul saying? He's saying you've got a choice. So Paul said, brethren, this is what I've figured out. I, I've got some things before me. I, I can continue to remember. Do you remember? I, I can continue to remember all my mess-ups, uh, all my sinfulness, uh, all my shortcomings, uh, all my good times, uh, and what I was, uh, and that will tell me why I'm not qualified to do what God has called me to do. Oh, you've been there. Especially if you've been called to preach, uh, you've been there. You, the devil will tell you you can't call, you can't preach. Uh, if you step into ministry uh, and, and you uh, step in, and they assign you and appoint you to a church, and you pastor that church, uh, and somebody begins to do a background, deep background check to see all the things that you've done, uh, you're going to be gone the first week because uh, you're not qualified for it. Uh, go, you know what you need to do uh, if you've prayed, if you've repented, if you've taken a bow face, uh, if you've been born again washed in the blood, uh, laid it at Jesus' feet. Uh, just go ahead and forget about that. Uh, that's not who I am anymore. Uh, that's who I was. I've been redeemed uh, by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, I've been called with a holy calling. Uh, I've been called with a holy purpose. Uh, I, uh, yeah, there are some things I need to forget. Oh, I do remember, uh, but I need to forget them. Uh, so forget about it. Uh, forget about it. I don't think your neighbor heard you earlier. Look at them again uh, and tell them, uh, forget about it. Uh, and when they look at you, look back at them and tell them, uh, yeah, forget about it. Uh, we need to forget some things. Uh, we need to, Paul said this thing that I've done, uh, I need to forget. Uh, I need to forget some things in the past. Uh, forgetting those things which are behind. Uh, what is he talking about, Pastor? Uh, forget anything that's hindering you from worshiping God. If you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking of something from yesterday or yesteryear uh, and it's stopping you from praising God, uh, if it causes your blood pressure to go up, you need to forget about it because it's hindering your worship. If it's stopping you from doing what you know God called you to do, forget about it. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember. Well, forget it. Forget it. Do you remember? But the psalmist said here, and you're forgetting, though, forget not all his benefits in Psalms 102 and 3. Psalms 119 and 16, he says, I will not forget thy word. So when Paul said this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I guarantee you he did not forget the Damascus Road. I guarantee you he did not forget the times that God spoke to him through Ananias and ministered to him. I guarantee you he did not forget those uh, that said, I don't care what you did as Saul. Ananias couldn't forget what Saul did, could he? The Lord said, Ananias, there's a man named Saul of Tarsus that's coming to you, and I want you to pray for him. And Ananias felt like he needed to give the Lord an update, didn't he? Um, Lord, I'm not sure if you know this, you all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty God, but he's a bad dude. He's killed some of my friends. He, Christians... Christian folks. Matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, Lord, that I've heard that right now he's got papers in his robe pocket. And he is on his way to persecute some more Christians. Right as you're speaking to me, he is on an agenda to destroy some things. And the Lord's like, yeah. What's your point? He said this. How, how do you know God talks like that? Because Jesus talked like that in John chapter 21. When the Lord said, was speaking to them, and they said, um, Lord, what about the one that failed you? What happened to him? What's going to become of him? He basically said, you let me worry about him. You need to worry about you. 
You need to do what I've called you to do. Read it. It's there in John chapter 21, last chapter of John. Don't read it now. Read it when you get home. I'm preaching. But he says there that, uh, that you, you need to take care of that, and I'm going to take care of that situation. So the Lord tells Ananias to do that, and Ananias said, I'll do it. So he anointed him, and he prayed for him. Uh, but Paul remembered that. I guarantee you he remembered that. He remembered those ones that uh, lowered him down in the basket to save his life. Uh, he remembered those that, uh, think about this. Paul, uh, I don't know if you know how bad Saul was. I don't know if you know how deep in sin he was. He was not qualified uh, to be a born-again believer. Uh, he was well qualified to be a religious leader. He was well on his way to being one of the rulers of of the Sanhedrin. Uh, not saying he wasn't religious. He was rare, very religious. Uh, but the scriptures tell us uh, that the only way that you can make it, the only way that you can make it to heaven, the only way you can make it in this world uh, is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but he remembers on the road to Damascus uh, that very same Jesus uh, that he was persecuting his followers for. Uh, he couldn't help but to look up uh, after he was struck blind uh, and laying on his back on the ground after he'd been knocked off his beast uh, by that light that shone through the, that darkness and penetrated into his life. Uh, he looked up, uh, couldn't see anything, uh, but he said these words, uh, Who art thou, Lord? Uh, and I love the answer. I am Jesus, uh, whom you persecuted. Uh, he will never forget uh, his encounter uh, with Jesus. Uh, he will never forget uh, the evidence of his goodness uh, that began to take place from that day forward. Uh, nobody else saw it. Uh, nobody else heard the voice, uh, but he heard it uh, and it changed his life. Uh, it changed his direction. Uh, he didn't go where he was going. Uh, he get, went back to where he came from uh, and he looked for a man named Ananias uh, and he prayed for him uh, and the scales fall, it fell off his eyes and he began to do the work of the Lord. Why did he continue on when he said things like this? Of sinners, I'm chief. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. How did he become the greatest writer of the New Testament? How did he become the man that God used to write most of the New Testament when he could always look back through his history and have plenty in his database to pull up. Listen, we may have had a bad past, but none of us was as bad as Saul was. Pulling up from his database, he could at any moment, he said, I have learned, I have learned that the only way that I'm going to make it, the only way that I cannot look back, he said, I've not apprehended, but there's one thing I know, this one thing that I do, I got to forget those things that this flesh wants to remember. You say, but, you know, I've tried to forget, but I still remember. That's because until the time that Jesus comes to deliver us from this body of flesh, we're going to, it's going to keep remembering. The flesh is going to keep remembering. It's going to keep popping up in your mind. Uh, we don't get brainwashed. Some people think we're brainwashed, but we don't get a clean slate. We get a clean slate, but we don't in the physical. Uh, everything that created and made up this body, these brain cells, the oldest camcorder that ever existed, the oldest video recorder that's ever been is right there in your brain. It will pull up stuff. Smells will trigger things from your past. Taste will tri trigger things from your past. Uh, it's always going to be there. Uh, and you say, well, I can't forget. I can't forget. In the flesh, you'll never forget what Paul is talking about. Understand that all of Paul's writings is about pulling us away from flesh uh, because flesh will fail uh, and pulling us up. Listen, uh, the, the flesh is flawed. Uh, and, and keeping uh, even the letter of the law is flawed. If we try to do it within the flesh, uh, no man's works is, it gives, it doesn't mean any good. It's filthy rags. So if we try to do this thing, by flesh. Uh, he said, you've got to forget about thinking uh, that you're going to accomplish something uh, in the flesh. Think about this. I don't know how old you are. You don't have to tell me how old you are. But as long as you've been able to, and you may have not be one of these people, but usually people January 1st make a New Year's resolution. And usually about right now, it's done. They done forgot. They've done forgot. They've done, it's why? Because the flesh is weak. The flesh is flawed. The flesh is weak. And we understand something uh, that the psalmist says, I will not forget thy law. I will not forget thy word. Uh, and we can never forget his word. We can never forget his law. Uh, listen, God didn't mess up when he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. He did not mess up. It's still his Ten Commandments. It's not his Ten Suggestions. It's still the commandments of God. 
The, the letter of the law is still in place. Uh, it's still important. Uh, but the, the Word of God says that the law became flawed when it was put in the hands of men. And they felt like, you've met them, they're still around. They think that they're the law. They think that they are God's spiritual lawmen. They think that they're the, the law, the police, the judge, and the executioner. That they going, I've known pastors over the years that I laid down the law. I nailed their hides to the wall. Well, good for you. I nailed them. I, I wore them out. But he said the law was flawed when it was placed in the hands of man that felt like that they needed to for, enforce it because you're not holy enough. You're not holy enough, and you're not holy enough, and you're not holy enough. And you've got, and so they needed, when you do that, you needed something to set up, an example uh, to set up. And many of them found out that they couldn't live up to being the example. They were flawed. Those priests would go into that temple more than one time. A priest would go in that temple to offer that yearly sacrifice. And he spent all year telling people how flawed they were. Uh, but they had to r- tie a rope around his ankle uh, because the bells quit ringing. Uh, it was around the skirt uh, because he fell dead. Why did he fall dead? Because he couldn't even keep the law. They had to pull him out and send in a, another. Uh, it was flawed. Uh, but does that mean that the law, uh, people say, well, we don't have to live by the law anymore. Uh, and listen, that's because in this flesh, uh, religion causes you to do that, uh, to think that I have got to do this and I've got to do that and, uh, and I've got to do this. We've probably heard it our whole life. Uh, if you want to go to heaven, you better do this and you better do that. Uh, listen, uh, Paul puts it best in Galatians uh, chapter 2, verse 20. He says, no longer I, uh, but Christ lives in me and through me. Uh, He said he's not come to destroy the law, uh, but he comes to fulfill the law. Everything that you need to live godly in this present world, uh, he said it's in you. Uh, He's in you. His spirit is in you. Uh, So quit letting the flesh answer the door. Uh, Quit letting the flesh uh, answer the email. Uh, Quit letting the flesh. What do you mean by the email? Uh, When Just think about this. Uh, When those thoughts of yesterday pop up in your mind, uh, that's a text message uh, from the flesh. Uh, That's a text message from the old you. Uh, That's an email from the old you popping up. Uh, Quit letting your flesh answer your emails. Uh, I love what one preacher said. Uh, He said, quit letting the devil uh, teach you the word of God. Uh, Quit letting the flesh uh, begin to give answers. Uh, Quit responding uh, in the flesh. What are you talking about, pastor? Uh, Quit responding with your emotions. Quit responding with your emotions. That hurt my feelings. Quit responding with your feelings. That broke my heart. Quit responding with your heart. Your heart is highly deceitful. The heart is deceitful. That just blew my mind. Well, quit trying to figure it out. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your paths. Forget about it. Forget about it. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember. Well, forget about it. Well, do you remember? Yeah, I remember. We'll keep remembering. What? All his benefits. In your forgetting, forget not all his benefits. In your forgetting, forget not his word. Forget not his commandments. Forget not his promises. So I think about this. Do you remember? And when we begin to remember, the flesh wants to remember all the mess-ups, all the shortcomings, all the things we had to give up, and all the things we had to quit doing because we became a Christian. And, and the flesh, you let the flesh, if you let the flesh carry on a conversation and talk to people, say, well, I can't do that no more because I got saved. That's really how the flesh will respond. But the spiritual man begins to say, I can't do that no more because it was a hindrance to what God wants to do. I can't go there anymore because it was hindering me from being what God wants me to be. I can't dress like that anymore because it hinders my testimony uh, of what God uh, wants people to see in my life. Uh, I can't do that anymore because it brought attention to me uh, and it did not bring attention to what God is doing in my life. Uh, it has brought attention uh, to my flesh. Uh, so therefore, uh, I yeah, I remember things that I had to give up. Uh, I remember uh, places that I used to go. Oh, uh, oh, I remember uh, when I was in the deepest, darkest moment of our life. Uh, you can pull them up from your database. Uh, but I want to ask somebody this morning, and all of you remembering, do you remember the evidence of His goodness all over your life? 
Oh yeah, the devil can take us back. The devil can take us back since we've been born again. And he can point out some things in our lives. And the devil can say, yeah, you remember. You remember when you did this. Yeah, I do, devil. But I also remember. I don't know if you remember. You might have forgot. But I also remember that I knelt down at that altar. Take him to the place. I knelt down right here. This altar. And this place. And I said, Lord, I read in your word, because I have not forgot his word. And all of my forgetting and all the things that I choose to forget, devil, I didn't forget his word. So I remember 1 John 1 and 9 told me if I confess my sins, he would forgive my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So yeah, devil, I remember I sinned. And I just look back at that verse and I couldn't see if that meant big sin, little sin, medium-sized sin. Because my sin that you're pointing out, uh, yeah, I remember, it was pretty bad. And I would be very ashamed if anybody knew that I did that. Uh, yeah, but I do remember that. Uh, but I also remember that when I knelt down uh, and leaned heavy on the mercies and the grace of God, uh, that God was took, uh, I took God at His Word, and you know what God did? Uh, God stood upon His Word. Uh, God was faithful to His Word. I confessed my sins. Uh, he forgave me of my sins, uh, and He cleansed me from all unrighteousness. Uh, do you remember the failure? Uh, if you remember the failure, you better also remember the victory. Uh, oh, do you remember the shortcoming uh, if you remember the shortcoming uh, you also better remember uh, at God's mercy uh, oh do you remember how long the night was uh, but you also better remember uh, how good it was when joy came in the morning uh, do you remember when you stayed up all night long crying uh, because everything was broken and undone uh, oh but do you also remember uh, that God shone in and brought a new day uh, oh do you remember uh, as one psalmist wrote this I believe it was Asaph uh, that wrote this uh, around Psalm 7 73, I believe it is. Uh, he said, my feet were well nigh to slipping. Uh, he said, I looked at the prosperity of the wicked. Uh, their eyes were bulging out of their head. Uh, and he said, I forgot uh, some things. Uh, I forgot. All I could remember uh, was how good they have it and how bad I got it. Until I walked into the house of the Lord. Oh, I remember their end. And I remember that their end I love this. He didn't say this, but I, I put this here in my thoughts, that their end is my beginning. <laughs> their end is my beginning. So do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember? There's some things that we must forget. But there's some things that we can't help but to remember that we do need to forget. But there's also things that we need to remember. Closing this morning, Paul wrote in the next chapter, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. By the way, this is my first close. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, the devil will tell you it's true. Well, no, it used to be true. That used to be true of me, but that's not who I am anymore. It may be wrapped in true, but it's still a lie. Amen. Whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Paul wrote in many places, in several places he wrote this about being in remembrance of those that he was writing to. He said, when I think of you, I think of you in prayer, I think of you in fond remembrance he was also writing to some people who had done him wrong at times. He wrote to some folks who had a hard time believing that God saved him and changed him. But he said that to them. He said, I have fond memories of you. He stood nose to nose with Peter. They had their debates. But he thought fondly and chose not to remember their encounter that day. But he chose to remember times of prayer times together and times that they spent. He had altercations with others and said, I'm not taking that man with me. He's not proving himself. I believe it was Matthew said, he's not going with me. And another brother took him, and they did great things. And that's how he ended up with Barnabas, and they ended up in prison on that first missionary journey. But when he wrote letters to their churches, he said, I think of you often in fond remembrance. In prayer, I remember you. I think of that as a pastor, as pastoring this wonderful congregation. I've had the privilege to pastor 
for 10 years now. As I have some memories, there's been some things that different ones and within the congregation have said to me over the years, and, and if I got in my feelings, that would have hurt my feelings. There's been times people said things to me, and I was like, if you think you can preach it better, you preach it. Because they felt like they needed to correct me in preaching. Sometimes they were in line, and sometimes they were out of line. You know what? As a pastor, if, if I choose to harbor all of those feelings and all of those emotions, I couldn't effectively minister to their needs. I couldn't effectively minister to your needs. People say, well, pastor, I'm, I'm going to move on, and I feel like we need to move on. But don't take it personal. It's hard not to. It's hard not to, but I don't hate those people. I don't dislike those people. I don't forget about every good time that we've had together and every good encounter we've had together. I'm not going to let the devil get that upper hand on me because I can't effectively minister. Because when I said, if you ever need me, call me. But if I sit here and remember all the time what they did to me when they called me, I ain't coming running. But if I choose to forget what they did, and choose to forget and choose to let it exalt itself and have authority over my decision-making and my thought process, I'm going to be able to do what God called me to do, and that's to pastor and to love the people. I'm going to do something a little different this morning. I do this not in any effort to embarrass anyone. But as I was praying the other day, I just I felt this on my heart, and I just said, Lord, if that's really what you want me to do when the altar service comes, remind me when I get to the altar. I didn't, like I said, I didn't come with any notes this morning. So I didn't then say, right here, do this. But God brought it back to my heart. So I just want to take a moment. I want to give a disclosure uh, before I do this. There's a lot of things that I remember. And I, I am kind of, remember Sister Amy says, I'm fly by the seat of my pants. So this is kind of one of those moments that I have a lot, a lot of fond memories, a lot of things. So maybe your memory is different than my memory. And maybe your recollection uh, is different than my recollection. Uh, and maybe when I get here, you'll say, you remember that and not this. Uh, don't allow the devil to do that this morning. This is something that God wants to do, I believe, in this moment. But I'm going to just start on one side of the room and work my way around. Sister Gilda, I remember in 2013 when God sent you to our church. And the greatest thing that I remember about that moment, how many remembers how tough it was without music on this platform? Because you had me and the CD. <laughs> but I remember giving you, Sister Gilda, an information sheet to fill out. And on that information sheet, it said, what works, what jobs do you have within the church? She'd only been here a few days, a week or so, and she wrote on there, church pianist. I got that, and I was in my office, and I guarantee you, I shouted a shout right there in my office. Because I didn't know, I knew she came, but I didn't know if she was here to stay, because people come and people go. Nine years later, she's still church pianist. I remember that, Sister Gilda. I remember that. Sister Pat, I, I remember a whole lot more. Like I said, when I do these, I remember a whole lot more, but that's what sticks out. Sister Pat, I remember. Oh, we got a lot of memories together. A lot of memories together over the years. I've known Sister Pat ever since I was a young, young evangelist. But what I do remember, Sister Pat, and all my memories of you, is in that, about that same moment, at that same time, we didn't have a song leader. And I said, we need a song leader. And Sister Pat came up to me. I believe she had the red back hymnal in her hand, shaking, tears streaming down her face. And she said, Brother Jamie, she said, I'll do it until we get one. And she did it until we got one. And that one, she didn't realize the one was going to be her. She's still doing it. I remember that, Sister Pat. I remember your heart to say, I, I may not be a, a song leader. I, I believe she even made reference. I can't do it like Midge did it, but I can do it. I'll do it. I'll give it my best shot. I remember that. That means the world to this pastor. Brother George, you and I got so many memories as well over the years and, and trying to recall and trying to remember. Uh, but my memory of you goes beyond since uh, uh, before you and I were past. Me and you've stood out at my truck and talked for hours. Uh, and we've had conversations. Uh, I remember uh, when your mom passed away in that moment and how strong you was in that moment uh, and how you ministered to the rest of your family during that service. Uh, but something that sticks with me is a song uh, that you sing, used to sing quite often. And in the middle of that song, he starts talking. And he talks about all those storm clouds. I used to love it. Sitting there, I used to love to visit Middleburg and hope 
was pretty sure if it was Sunday night it was going to happen, that Brother George was going to sing tonight. And if he sung, that he was going to sing that song. Because right in the middle of that song that he would say, all of a sudden, those roll, those, I don't even know how it goes now, but say it, Brother George, just do it one more time. I remember the first time he said it because it was a dark hour in my life. I remember that, Brother George. It ministered to me. Sister Lisa, I remember so many, so many memories of you and your kindness that when I was evangelist that she said, come on out to the house, we'll feed you. Her goodness. It's coming. She said, they would come up to me and say, what are you doing this afternoon? I said, well, I figure either I'll go back if Brother Douglas wants me to. Uh, maybe Brother Douglas was out of town. Uh, he, sometimes he would leave me a key. I figure I'll just go hang out uh, at his house, or maybe I'll drive back to Jacksonville and then come back tonight. I said, no need to do that. Come on out to the house. Y'all come on out to the house. Just make yourself at home and be comfortable. I remember that, Sister Lisa. I remember your kindness. I remember your goodness to us. Lexi, all of my memories of you, I have to go to a scene that unfolded in Guatemala. A picture that was taken in Guatemala. The girls braided her hair, I believe. I think in that picture, her hair is in braids. Am I correct? Does anybody else remember her? Her hair is braided. But I think, I don't know who captured the picture, but they captured the picture and the children were around her there on that mission field. We didn't know after that mission field all the things that would unfold and how the enemy would fight and move and come against her. But, Lexi, all the time that you were gone, all the times that you were away from the Lord, that was the image I kept remembering. Why? Because that's what God's called you to do. That's what God's called her to do. I don't tell her that. She told me that. Long before all, all the, uh, the shortcomings and the backslidings, she said, I feel like that's what God's calling me to. So I remember that, and I hope you continue to remember that. And Sister Cohen, you say, I just got here. You don't remember nothing about me. Oh, yeah, I do. I do. Sister Cohen, I, I remember you coming in here, and I ask you, you from around here? Nope, I live in Mandarin. I say, What? But I remember her saying this, I drive 45 minutes to work. It don't bother me to drive 45 minutes to church. And I thought, wow. Because you know why? She's a pastor's daughter. So she knows. She knows. And I also remember that one Sunday, you and I were standing there talking. Before we knew it, it was one third. Matter of fact, the day after, a couple of days after, I think she sent me a, a text message or a message on Facebook with a kid laying in the floor said, waiting on daddy because your daddy's a pastor, waiting on daddy to go home. But she thought that I was ministering to her, but she was also ministering to me. I remember that, Sister Cohen. Sister Emma, you don't talk much, do you? She's a sweet soul. And I was, I was ready. I was ready. I remembered you know why she don't talk much? She don't get a chance. Anybody knows Brother Kevin knows she don't get a chance. But I remember Brother Kevin walking up to me on that Sunday evening. I know some of y'all want to go home. I'm sorry, but this is what the Lord led me to do. Brother Kevin said, we've been away a long time. I didn't even know this church was down this road. But we need to come back to the Lord. Do you mind if we come? I said, come on. That's what I remember about them as a family. But I remember... Many times, actually, during revival, during, during services, as I walk around and, and pray for people, just the sweet spirit the Sister Emma has when she sits there on that front pew and begins to, to pray. And begins to, you, she may not talk a lot to us, she talks a lot to God. Because she's just pouring it out. Praise. Praise. That blesses my heart, Sister. Keep doing it. Sister Patsy, what I remember about you, I actually remember about Leslie first. I had been at church just a short time, and we was having some electrical issues with one of the storage sheds, and it was probably about midnight, about 11 o'clock. It was late at night, and I'm out there flipping the light on, flipping it off, flipping it off, flipping it off, trying to figure out what was going on with the light. I was out there working on it late, late at night. And Leslie comes walking across there. Who are you? Who are you? 
I said, oh, I'm, I'm the new pastor, just been here a short time. He said, all right, I just keep an eye on this property. wanted to make sure. He didn't ask for my ID, at least. He believed me. But I appreciate the fact that when we were at Howard Road, they looked out for that property. But what I remember about you specifically, sis, is the first time, first time that I recall that she walked across that little dirt road between our house, our the church house and her house, that she walked in that door. I believe Amy Kahn, I believe, invited her to church, that you came across there and you came and you was in that service, and you sat there on that pew for the first time. I remember that first church service. remember you sitting there, and I'm thankful for you, thankful for what God's doing in your life. I've been praying for Maverick. I'm believing God's going to heal his eyes. And we've stood with you and continue, will continue to stand with you, believing God for your family. Well, Larry and Sister Linda, there's so many great memories of these two. The victories that just a short time they've been with us, the victories that God has wrought in their life. Oh, she remembers, and we all do too. God delivered her from cancer. She rung the bell, and we all wear pink from time to time just to remember it. But what I remember about these two, they attended one church service, one church service, and said, Pastor, can we meet with you? I said, Sure. So I met with them at their house. They didn't have a lot of questions to ask me. They just wanted to inform me we found our new home, and we want to be a part of Middleburg Church of God. It took them one service to make that determination. And what's interesting about that is they say, because your church is the friendliest church that we've ever been in. I believe it was that same week that somebody told me, is your church is the most unfriendly church I've ever been in. All about perspective. So I appreciate your perspective. And Gracie, I, I remember the day you was born. But what I remember about Gracie goes far past Gracie's memories. I shared this a few weeks ago, but I remember sitting in my living room praying, and God began to speak to me about my children, what he would do. Gracie was about two years old, and she was a terror. I was convinced that she wasn't my child. She was the devil's child. And she was bad. She was... Whew, Gave, you talking about terrible too? She said, I accept the challenge. Oh, man. So I was as shocked as anybody when the Lord said, I'm going to use Gracie for my glory. Gracie's going to do great things for the kingdom of God. I might not get emotional about everybody, but I'll get emotional about that one. That's my baby. God said, I'm going to use her. And when God started doing it here in these last couple years, God did not tell me when I start doing that, the devil will step back and let me do it. The devil will step back and just let it happen. So I've watched that battle take place over the last couple of years. But I remember, Gracie, and you remember what God spoke to your heart. Oh, Brooke, 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 Brooke. She said, he don't remember nothing about me. I do. I remember Brooke coming to our church and just not sure how she's going to fit in and what this is all about. She probably was like I was when I used to go to church with my daddy. These people are crazy. These people lost their mind. Little did we know that Noah and Brooke, I think, actually went to school together or went to the same school in Callahan years ago. We didn't know that. But what I remember about Brooke is there's no way for her to remember it because she was asleep. This past summer, we was coming back from North Carolina from a youth camp me her and gracie was in the car and they were crashed out in the back seat and i was crashed out in the front seat no i'm just joking they were out and i i remember looking back there saying man they're tired they're wore out but my how god used them how god moved in them this week and the question that brooke asked me when she woke up might have been before she went to sleep said brother jamie can you explain better to me about sanctification i want to know more about sanctification i remember that and i hope i gave you a good answer and i hope you've been deep diving into it and you've been pursuing it and there's my my buddy i asked hayden this morning i said do you got your text for me to put on the screen this morning he looked at me like i said i said you dressed like a preacher today i thought you was ready to preach he shaved that little beard that he's been trying to grow off and got his hair off, did it up. 
But what I remember about Hayden was at a youth camp, PYFC, 2015, I believe it was. Everybody had left, just about it. And Hayden was still in the altar praying. And there was another young man there, young black man, boy, that was there praying from North Carolina. You remember that kid? He's a piece of work. I know these boys wanted to punch him in the mouth because there was a time or two that week I wanted to punch him in the mouth. That boy was just something else. But that evening, that last service, he was in the altars. And he was praying. He was pressing in. And I guess he made everybody mad all week because there was nobody praying with him. He was praying by himself. And Hayden started praying with him. And as Hayden was over there praying with him, I was over uh, across the building and uh, praying and praying with some that was still lingering in prayer. And then began to talk to some folks. And I looked up. And when I looked up, Hayden, and when you never hear say nothing, one, you never see do you don't see much of him. His family's up here uh, leading on the instruments and all that. But uh, Hayden, he's kind of that quiet backward one. Hayden's got this kid. He's got his hand in the middle of his chest, and he's praying. That kid's going backwards, hands in the air, Holy Ghost all over both of them. And Hayden is just praying and pouring out his heart and just just flood the Spirit of God just flooding him as he's ministering to the needs of Israel. I don't even know if Hayden remembers that, but I, I remember that. I remember how God used him in that moment. Uh, and that's what I remembered uh, when Hayden said, I don't even believe in God anymore, Mama. I don't believe there is a God. She said, you can believe what you want to, but as long as you live in my house, you're going to church. So he kept coming to church. So all those times uh, that when, when he was there for that long time and that long season, uh, that he was there in that moment saying, I, I don't believe this and I don't believe that. Uh, I remember uh, that I, I asked him about that, I believe. How can you deny what God did there uh, if he, there's not a God? Uh, and so I remember that moment. Uh, so the devil would want us to remember your kids are away. Well, I remember when God moved on our kids, and the God that did it then will do it now. I remember that, Hayden. Sister Amy Kahn, I remember lot, lots. In our time of knowing each other, special memory is when you asked me to officiate your wedding. That was special that you chose me to do that. I remember that, but that's not my fondest memory of you. My fondest memory of you is when you came back to church here, still living in Jacksonville. And she said this. She said, I've been to a lot of churches, tried to visit a lot of churches in Jacksonville. But she uses the words of Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home. She said, there's no place like home. And so for a long time, she drove the drive from over there to over here. And I also remember a Facebook post from her that she had wrote something down, put some notes in her Bible, and she said, see, Pastor Jamie, I was listening. I was listening. I'm, I'm trying to go through this quickly. But do you remember? Do you remember? Brother Paul, I remember. Oh, I remember a lot. Oh, I, I remember all the who is this text. I was like, if that dude couldn't kill me with one hand, I'd punch him in the mouth. Send him a text and just, just pour my heart out in a text message and, and thinking, yeah, this is going to hit the mark and this, gonna, this is going to be it. This is going to be the text that, that causes him to say, I'm going to church on Sunday. And he says, who is this? <laughs> Yeah, I remember that, but I remember another text message that I didn't send that he sent me. And I don't know if I still have the same phone or not because I, I, he thinks I'm goofy because I keep all my text messages. So when you become a pastor, you do the same thing because whatever I say, I don't want to be held against me. You said this. No, I didn't, and I can go back. Or I can say, yeah, I did. I'm sorry. But I remember him sending me a text saying, I'm not very in touch. I believe he put it last. I'm not very in touch with my emotions, but I think I got saved last night. A Thursday morning text message. Anybody ever got a good Thursday morning text message? That's the best Thursday morning text message you can ever get. Thursday is the forgotten day of the week. We give a lot of attention to Monday because it's so bad usually. Give a lot of attention to Friday. Give a lot of attention to Sunday. The Thursday morning text message. That message told me he got saved. I'm hurrying because I, I'm, I'm testing some of your patience. But when I get to you, you'll be glad that I remember something good about you. Brother Draven, what I remember about you is a little goofy mohawk you used to wear. He had that goofy mohawk, and he was knelt, knelt down in the back corner of the church at Howard Road. 
And I went back there, and I knelt beside him. It was the same service, I believe, that Mama got filled with the Holy Ghost. But Dick Draven was knelt down in the back of the church. And I knelt down there beside him. I said, Draven, are you saved? He said, I think so. I said, you're not. Because this ain't a hope so, think so, maybe so. He said, we can fix that right now. Had an opportunity to lead him to the Lord right there in that pew. And I've watched as God has moved and ministered in him as he's grown into a young man. Become the man of God. And becoming the man of God that he wants him to be. Sister Lonnie and Brother Charlie. So many fond members, memories of them and their goodness. and All of us remember Brother Charlie, especially every time I, when our air conditioner breaks down. But what I do remember about that is that he responds. That he takes time to help. And this is what I remember. He did some deep work on the church air conditioner. And, and I looked at him and I said, Brother Charlie, what do I owe you? Said, you don't owe me nothing. You don't owe me anything. So I... I remember your generosity, Brother Charlie. Remember, remember that. Remember, and I thought we were. I thought I was just special. That it was just something he did for the church. And I talked to many others, and they said, "It's just who he is." Appreciate Sister Vani. Got memories of Vani, Sister Vani, and those memories come mostly from Facebook posts. If you post some, if I post something, she responds with a heart. What you got to love about Sister Bonnie is her love for the babies and the love for what God is doing in the lives of the babies. So I, so I remember that, Sister Bonnie. Remember your heart and your love and your care for others. Sister Joyce, what I remember about you, so many memories that I have. This is include James. James may not know this, but before he, she married him, she asked for my permission, basically. She said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, I've kind of been talking to this man. And, and she, she went into it just like a little teenage girl would come into her daddy's room and say, I think I want to marry him. And she said, I just want to make sure it's all right. You won't think. I said, go for it. Go for it. But also remember that before that, I just wanted to make sure before that, every service, she gave me a big hug. I said, one question I've got for you. Does that mean I don't get my hugs anymore? She said, no, 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 you still get those. So now I, I hug her when I get a chance to. I hug her and smile at him. And what I remember about Brother James, Brother James, you may not know this, Brother James has been raised up, been around Baptist his whole life, good, good Baptist Christian all of these years. Been everywhere, got some great stories. But I was visiting them not too long ago, and Sister Joyce reiterated this a couple services ago when he came down for prayer. He told me, I've been studying, been looking into stuff. I want, he wants to be filled with the Holy Ghost. He wants to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I believe that God's going to fill him with the Holy Ghost. I'm almost done. Brother and Sister Laney, I've got, I've got some memory, some recollection of revivals past coming in and y'all being there. And that's, that right there is exactly what I remember, that big smile. That's, that's what I remember from them. But here recently, a few services in, we were in revival. When we was in the camp meeting, Brother Laney came to me and said, let me just tell you something, Pastor. I probably will not be here for the night services. It's too difficult to drive at night. We have a hard time seeing. We'll be here for the day services. I don't think they missed a service all week. And he looked at me somewhere during that camp meeting. He said this. He goes, man, it feels good to be in church we feel like we're home i remember that that blessed my heart because this year's been tough it's been tough on all of us and to know that someone is be able to sit down in one of our worship services and say man this is just what i need this is what i need our guest this morning i don't remember your name i remember jim right what's the wife's name loretta they visited us a few weeks ago i remember that and i remember them sitting in here in the service. But what I remember, they said, give us enough chances, we'll do something that you'll like. They gave us another chance. I remember that. Sister Amanda, I remember so much. Sister Amanda and I go way back. I believe the first time Sister Amanda and I met, she was 15 and I was 18 or 19. First time visiting 
and we we've were acquaintances for a long time. We became friends over the years, close friends. And I'm not saying this to embarrass her. I'm not saying this uh, to belittle. This came from her. This morning, you received a giving report. First of the year, we give out the giving report of what you gave. And it was one of my first years here. It may have been my first year here. We gave Sister Manor a giving report. And she looked at it, and she looked mad. And I said, is something wrong, sis? She said, that's all? I said, what do you mean? That's all I put into the church last year? I said, I'm pretty sure. Let me go. I thought it was a pretty good amount. I mean, I didn't know. I don't know what she, didn't know what she made. And I said, I can go back and check. She said, oh, I don't need you to check. That's all I put in the church last year. She wasn't mad at me. She was upset and disappointed in herself. And I'm not doing this to toot horns. I'm not doing this to hang pin roses. I'm not doing this to embarrass. But can I, I can tell you this much. The biggest giver in our church is the one that said, I don't think that I gave enough. She may have gave plenty. I don't know. I, I don't know the numbers. I don't know that. But I know that I remember in that moment that she says, that's not who I want to be. I want to do better. And from that moment, not just in finances, but in every aspect of her life. And you know what that response did, that aspect of her life did? Her husband got saved. Her children got saved. Her husband, even before, I don't know if he knew it or not, even before he got saved, he was tithing on his money. He knew it. He still did it. Because something happened inside of them. Sister Donna Kay, I just, I just remember... All the memories of her, I just remember this. It's an ongoing memory. Her love and her ability to connect with kids and children. Her love and passion that she pours into kids. And I thought, man, she's just a great kids minister. She does that for everybody. Sister Donna Kay's just got such a heart for people and such a heart. Anything I've ever asked Sister Donna Kay to do, she's done it. Here a few weeks ago, I wasn't here. Sister Donna Kay, as far as I know, is not a song leader. And she's, she led singing. So I remember that. I remember that. Remember your faithfulness. Why, why don't you go through all of that this morning? Because I want you to know sometimes you think, that pastor don't think nothing to me. That pastor don't care about me. He's always being mean to us. He's always being hard on us. He's always uh, uh, just reminding us of our faults and our felt failures and our shortcomings and, and all of those things. No, I hold fond memories of you. I remember your goodness. I remember uh, your faithfulness. I remember uh, your love for God. I remember uh, what God has done. I know I remember and know that that's going to be a cultivator to what God is going to do in your life. In your life. Stand with me. I'm really done this time. I told you that was my first close. You got excited 30 minutes ago when I said in closing. I'm sorry it's 1230, but I felt the need to do that. You say, well, go ahead. Go ahead. She's not letting the rocks in her driveway cry out for her, and she's not letting Sister Donna Kay lead singing for her. But God's called her to do it. Do you remember? If, you, if you're going to remember whatsoever things are true, lovely, pure, virtue, those are things that you need to remember. Because of all that other stuff is stopping you, hindering you, preventing you from becoming what God wants you to be. So I choose to remember the goodness of God. I choose to look at the evidence, not the evidence that's stacked up against me, but the evidence of His goodness all over my life. So let me ask you this morning, do you remember? If you do this morning, I just want you to step out. Make your way around this altar this morning with hand raised and say, Lord, I remember when you came through one more time. Lord, I remember that. You can remember that dark moment. But I also want you to remember how God showed up right on time. 
Maybe you're in that dark moment right now, and it's hard to forget because it's there. But also remember this. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God that came through the last time, he's about to come through again. Do you remember? Do you remember? Father God, we come with a remembrance. We come with a remembrance that we are a flawed people. We come with a remembrance that we have faults, failures, and shortcomings and inadequacies. We also come remembering your mercy. Remember mercy. Remembering your grace. Remembering your love. Remembering your kindness. Do we remember? Yeah, I choose to remember you, God. Bless around these altars this morning, we ask.